like <laughs> says, oh, dude, if, there's, if you want to become a great skier, there's only one thing you can do. And then it cuts to the song, and it says what you need is a sports training montage. Even Rocky had a montage. You show a lot of stuff and quit that happens all at once. Show a little progression and move it forward. Got to have the sports montage. And then a couple of other lines. Are, are we missing anything? Yeah, go from beginner to a pro, you need a montage. Yeah, and in order to go from a beginner to a pro, you got to have a montage, right? In the very end, it says, yeah, at the end of the montage, you got to fade to black to make it seem like a lot of time has passed. You got to have a montage, right? Mocking. Absolutely, I mean, as South Park does so well, absolutely, we have to kill this because it will start playing again. Sorry. Uh, doing like what South Park does best, absolutely slamming film, classically styled film, that uses a form of editing that we're going today under the cover called montage here at the end. Uh, oh, sorry, at the top, rather. That is that South Park in mocking this thing is mocking the ways in which movies rely heavily upon edited material that takes up some um, un, uh, indistinct amount of time and then compresses that stuff into a very small stage, so uh, a, a small sequence. So even Rocky's got to have a montage. When Rocky is training in Rocky IV to fight Drago, he's going to go to Russia, and we're going to cross-cut between Rocky training and Drago training. He's going to have Drago running up a treadmill that's like it's 12.0 or something like this. He's going to be hooked to machines and breathing at rest. He's going to be getting shots of steroids, we assume they're steroids. Intercut, crosscut rather, with Rocky who's running up outside, up snowy hills. He's curling, uh, he's curling tree trunks and doing pull-ups from, the, from uh, old burned out barns. And then he's, you know, uh, uh, all this sorts of natural, it's the whole montage of natural training and this manufactured Soviet thing, right? This Russian who does it the wrong way, right? And it compresses an indistinct amount of time. You don't know how long Stan has been training here, just like in Rocky. You don't know how long that is, but when you watch it, you see it as a whole thing, W-H-O-L-E. You see it as an entirety, show a lot of stuff happening at once, so the audience knows what's going on, got to have a montage. Right? And so Rocky, or South Park here, uh, uh, rather South Park here, is mocking what Rocky does, but what all sorts of movies do, in an attempt to compress time into a very short amount of time, and it's perceived by the audience as a whole thing, that you've got the training, you get it, that Rocky's a naturalist, and that he's American because he's a naturalist, whatever. Uh, regardless, and you get that through the contrast that's set up between the, with the cross cut with uh, the training sessions with Drago. And so our initial definition of what is a montage is dynamic, quick, fast-paced editing, in this instance, in order to compress time. We can't watch him train forever. We can't watch all of the training that goes into fighting Drago, so you condense it down, but the audience perceives it as a whole thing. So montage as a, uh, as a style of editing that's quick, fast-paced, and dynamic. In this instance that we've seen, we see it at, 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 as about the contraction of time, make, taking a lot of time and making it into just a minute-long clip, for our example here. So what I want you to focus on here then is this style of editing is about time, in a way, because the history that we're going to talk about today, coming through Serge Eisenstein, we're going to find out that the original form of what montage was for Serge Eisenstein. And in order to do that, we actually have to back up uh, 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 at the, from the bottom of these notes and move, uh, and move up, actually. I kind of got them out of the way. So we're talking roughly about the same time period as German cinema. Remember, that's 1919. It starts, German, uh, German Expressionism starts with the release of, what though? Okay, what, the German Expressionist time period starts with the release of what movie? The Cabinet Thing. There we go, The Cabinet Thing, that's right. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, right? And then ends with, the coming, uh, with, with Hitler's rise to uh, the Chancellorship of Germany in 1933, right? So we're roughly in the same time period, and just in a couple of countries over, well, in a big collection of countries called the Soviet Union, which are brand new at this time, collection of countries uh, under the, what is, what is Lenin, the premier? Is one the, was one the premier of the Soviet Union? Who led this? I think, it, it, whatever, it doesn't matter. Lenin's the, uh, the, the, Lenin's the uh, 
leader of the Soviet Union at this time, and he has a very clear conception for himself, very clear conception of the ways in which society, <laughs> this Soviet Union, ought to operate. And this much of that theoretical basis for the ways in which this new Soviet Union ought to form come from guys Frederick Hegel and Karl Marx. Karl Marx, you hear his name bandied about all the time in news coverage and that sort of thing. You hear the absolutely ridiculous equation of Obama with Karl Marx or, or, or as being a Marxist, and that sort of thing. We don't have time to go into why and how utterly absurd that sort of equation is, but this is that same guy, Karl Marx, who learned a couple hundred years prior from a guy named Frederick Hegel. These guys thought Frederick Hegel is a philosopher, and Karl Marx is not a politician, though he is always talked about in political conversations. Karl Marx was very much an economist first, but not first, foremost. And Karl Marx learns from Frederick Hegel, who's a kind of a philosopher, uh, is a philosopher at the time. They believe that all of histories, all, all different types of histories, natural history, human histories, economic histories, all these different types of histories operate in, in a similar fashion. They operate by what, what I'm calling, or what they call up here, the dialectic. Now, the, from the Greek word, uh, like dialogue, you hear dialogue is in here. Socrates, uh, when he set up his academy way, way back in ancient Greece, he set it up as a place not where a teacher would stand in front of the classroom like this and disseminate information, if, if I do that, I have no idea. But he thought about education as always operating as a dialogue, that through conversations, new knowledge would arise out of that stuff. Now, you've got to remember that the ancient Greeks are in a much different time and place in relationship with information and knowledge. You know that, for example, today, they claim that in every two days in the world, we double the amount of information and data that is created. Every two days, we double, right? We double the amount of data and information that is produced. So we're living in a time in which inf the notion of what information is and what data and knowledge is is constantly increasing exponentially in that way. So a small world thinking about, uh, about ancient Greece, you need to put yourself in that small world thing. But they believe, uh, Socrates, that in, through dialogue, through the exchange of ideas, back and forth, knowledge would come out of that. So <coughs> Frederick Hegel, a century, a, a millennia later, and Karl Marx, <coughs> another 200 years after that, continue that sort of thinking and think uh, and, and believe that what happens is that a thesis, as I've got it up here, or a force, or we could put uh, something like an idea up here, comes in conflict or collision or comes in contrast to another idea, which I've written up here as antithesis. In English, we use uh, the word antithesis incorrectly. We tend to use it as the exact opposite of, but really it just means something that is contrary to. So there can be many antithesi, antitheses, <coughs> and there can be many antitheses to one idea, to something in sharp contrast to. So one idea comes along, uh, or is put forth, and another idea, or the antithesis, or another <coughs> thesis come along, or counterforce, as I have up here, and in that collision, uh, as I've got a, a colliding here, out of that comes something new that, we're call, that I've called up here the synthesis, the new idea. For math folks, it would look something like A and B, a and B, though, here in this equation, and it's totally loose here, produce something brand new. They don't produce A, B in that way, in that sense. It's not, it, they don't end up forming A, B. As your government, our government, ought to work this way. In a sense, it's designed this way. That the House of Representatives, as you know, there's an aisle down there on the Republicans and the Democrats, why in the world we're locked into a two party system is absolutely ridiculously absurd. <laughs> Regardless, what should happen is this group should have an idea. This group has an idea because they come from different parties, different modes, ways of thinking, different ideological standpoints. Those ideas should come in conflict or in committee, really. The House of Representatives, these things are worked out in committee. And out of that ought to come the new idea, right? That's the way it ostensibly ought to operate. You know that our government just works much differently than that. Who's the loudest and who has the most money and, uh, and, and can shout the loudest in whatever way they shout, those are the people who end up winning. Turn the tide of public opinion and you can do whatever you want to do. 
kind of done. But that's the way our government is actually set up. It ought to work in that sort of way. So Karl Marx gives uh, Lenin this, uh, oh, excuse me, let me continue this. So this synthesis then is going to come a new idea or a new thesis that's going to come in conflict with a new antithesis that this relationship is going to continue ad infinitum, forever, right, in that idea. So that if we were out here today and we see where we are with ideas about economy, economics, <coughs> or about politics, in some weird way, we could almost backtrack on this and say, oh, this is where that idea came from. This is how we got to where we are today, because these ideas morph in this way, uh, change as the result of their collision. Even someone like uh, uh, Charles Darwin, right, the guy who gave us the theories of evolution, uh, and I ideas about natural selection thought much like this. Uh, he did. That is, that the idea of natural selection and evolution is that an organism comes in conflict, or mating, with another, and then out of that something new evolves, right? Now this doesn't happen with one consummation, right? One relationship, but over millions and millions of years that stuff Charles Darwin suggests, this is how we got to where we are in terms of biological history. So in some loose way, even Charles Darwin is thinking along these lines. Well, this sets the foundation for uh, uh, much of the socialist thinking that goes into the politics of the USSR, but simultaneously it's going to give rise to Sergei Eisenstein's conception, thinking about this idea and how to make that, <laughs> transfer that rather, to film. How to bring the ideas that Lenin very much puts at the foundation of the USSR and how to employ those. Because anyone who, like, uh, like um, Sergei Eisenstein comes along in the Soviet Union, you're, that is a major cultural force, is going to go have to meet with Lenin at some point and justify his actions. Lenin is all about, just like Mussolini, we've already talked just very briefly about Mussolini, and we talked a little bit about Hitler and German cinema. Lenin as well is going to use cinema as a teacher. So he's going to want to hear, not a clown, right? That this contrasted with the ways in which classical cinema is starting to emerge in the 1920s as entertainment value, as a clown performing whether it be straight out of the clown silent slapstick <coughs> mode, or even later in the 1920s with gangster pictures, and then the Western that comes along, these are about entertainment, etc. This is how you came into this semester. I go to movies to watch. I go into movies to turn my brain off. I go to be entertained, whatever it happens to be. That that's the basis of American cinema. For Germany, for Italy, and now for the USSR, there's a much different conception at this time in the 20s and 30s. Much different conception of what cinema ought to be. So Lenin, uh, Eisenstein is going to have to sell his movies and his ideas as they contribute to thinking in a socialist manner. So just as Lenin wants uh, film to be a teacher, so uh, uh, Eisenstein here is going to use his films as a teaching tool. The number one rule, uh, the <coughs> lesson that's learned from Sergei Eisenstein's movie is that the man's got his thumb on you in some way. The man is keeping you down under my thumb. Whatever it happens to be, right? The, the man has got you down in some sort of way. In 1920s, when the, the only film we're going to watch for today is called Battleship. Oh my gosh, they're making a movie on Battleship, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. yeah. With aliens. With aliens, yes, yeah. right. So how does how does an alien? Do, oh my gosh, it's just like gonna make me cringe to think of how the alien is gonna say you sank my fat. You know, I mean, yeah, you know, how is the alien awesome. gonna say that? That's just deadly. Oh my gosh, who's the genius <coughs> who came up with this idea? You know who the genius is? It's pure genius, by the way. It's pure genius. Man. Who do you have to pay? Nobody, right? You don't have to go pay a writer. Right? for the scenario and that sort of thing. It's genius. Hey, we'll just special effects it, man, no problem. Right? Everything in that movie, you guarantee it, right, is going to be about the spectacle and the cinema of attractions, <laughs> that stuff that we talked about in the earliest time of film. Now, I, it's, not, it's not too far-fetched to make the claim that we're in another period of the cinema of attractions. I mean, if you go and watch The Chronicle or Battleship, or Battlefield, Battlefield Los Angeles, Battle, 
Yeah. Battle of Los Angeles, whatever that was. Right? I mean, it's about the spectacle of the thing, right? The wow, look at that, look at that sort of stuff, rather than anything about the development of story. I'm not necessarily criticizing that either, right? That we, but we do want to recognize that there is that mo movement in cinema, and particularly in Hollywood cinema, back towards that notion of spectacle. Why is that? Because it seems that, hey, if I can just get you to watch spectacle, I can get you to come back every week and watch what you think is another spectacle. Right? That is, you don't have to sit there and think or process or engage in any sort of way. Plus, it keeps you from watching and paying attention to all the other stuff, right? the real stuff that matters in the world. That way. Like Nancy Grace. Oh my gosh, is she just the most <laughs> horrific thing ever? Uh, I'm sorry, she's right down the street, because she could probably like nuke me from right down the street, too, um, I'm sure. Right, so the only movie we're going to check out today is a movie called Battleship, the Battleship of Tevkin. No matter what film class you're in, what university in the world, frankly, uh, if you're in a big survey like this, you're going to check out this, this movie. You're going to definitely watch the longer clip that we watched today, which, we're gonna, uh, which is generically called the Odessa Step Sequence. We're going to put on that. Every person ever taken this class at any university has checked out, has checked out this clip because it's going to lead directly to South Park and Rocky before that and that sort of stuff. I'll make that connection much more clear in just a moment. Right? So Eisenstein, in making this movie and countless other movies that he's doing, is using film as an educational purpose in, in an educational manner in order to remind the people in the Soviet Union about the revolution. That in 1914, when they killed the czar and his ministers and Anastasia screamed in vain? What song is that? I was round when we killed the czar and his ministers and Anastasia screamed in vain. Sympathy for the devil. There we go. Sympathy for the devil. Rolling Stones may be one of the top five rock and roll songs of all time. Okay, other than like pour some sugar on me or something. But anyway, <laughs> that's just the funniest dang song of all time right there. I'm hot, sticky, sweet from my head to my feet. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's just fun. Like, who would say that about himself? <laughs> and would you want it to be that way? Anyway, whatever, right? All right, so other than that, sympathy for the devil. Ten bonus points. All right, I'll, I'll write it down in a minute. Uh, so, oh, just, sorry, that's a long diatribe right there. Uh, uh, so, uh, in 1914, when they assassinate the Tsar, they were taking down the number one man, right, who had dominated this large swath of Western, uh, Western, uh, Eastern Europe and Western Asia, right? It's a huge thing. And the Tsar was definitely not thought of very well. The Tsar controlled millions and millions of people by first carrying the cross into, into cities, and then the sword came right after him. Not too dissimilar to the way in which the, uh, the Anglophiles went on crusades back hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, King Henry, uh, King Richard III, most notably, goes from his king, uh, his prince when he leaves, uh, and goes down to uh, Air, uh, Arabia, what they would have called Arabia at the time, and we killed, we, I don't know who we are, uh, they killed hundreds and thousands of people with the cross coming first and going, you converted? You converted? No? Okay. Off we go. Well, we killed hundreds of thousands of people on that march going down to try to convert Jerusalem into a Christian, into a Christian city at that time. So uh, the, uh, the, the czar was definitely thought of in this bad way. It's the number one man who's under my thumb. Right? There we go. There we go. More Rolling Stones in there. We don't have to move like Mick Jagger. We just want to quote the old good stuff. Do you really want to move like a 69-year-old man? Is this really the... Anyway, isn't that the new song? It's not so good. Not good. Sorry. All right. So this gives this gives the kind of philosophical basis to why Eisen, the type of work that Eisenstein's going to do in his films. Now, how does how now let's work back towards that to join both an understanding of knowledge, right, information, knowledge being created by the collision of ideas. Something new comes up continuously at infinitum. How do we connect that idea up with cinema? 
Well, to back it up just a little, before Eisenstein gets involved in his own filmmaking, he is party to a thing called the Kuleshov Workshop. It's just named after a guy named Lev Kuleshov. So in the 19-teens, uh, Soviet filmmakers are interested, because remember, they're fresh into the Soviet Union, they, the, under the mandate to use film as an educational, propagandistic tool, and so they're, using ex they're doing experiments with film, editing experiments primarily, and they're using a, a film in order, in editing, in order to figure out how to best deliver information, how to, blast, uh, uh, to best, in Eisenstein's word, to pierce the mind's eye with a pitchfork in that way. He wanted to tap directly into another quote, the cerebral cortex of the viewer. Right? Okay, so that sounds grandiose and all that, but you need to hear behind that is he's trying to figure out in this, in this workshop, in this experiment, how to edit in such a way as to get people to see the new knowledge and the new understanding of the ways in which the world, at least the Soviet world, ought to operate. So under the Lev Kuleshov's workshop, Sergei Eisenstein uh, and others um, do uh, certain experiments. So they show movies to people, or rather clips or shorts to people, and then they do audience response sort of thing. What did you see? How did that make you feel? All that sort of stuff. And one of the most famous that it, they do uh, is showing, taking a uh, a, a full, uh, excuse me, uh, a close-up of famous actor, and you would, we would have recognized them in the Soviet Union in the teens, some famous actor's face that was flat, affectless, nothing going on, right? No look of surprise or happiness or sadness or anything, just very, very flat face, and then they edited the, from that to a hot bowl of soup. Hold that for a little while, but it was a lot, you could see steam coming off, it's not just a picture. Then back to that same guy's same expressionless, affectless face, then edit back in uh, a woman laying in a coffin. Hold that for a while, cut, same guy's face, cut, now there's a little girl playing with a teddy bear or something like that. Cut, same guy's face, that's it. And they do an audience response afterwards, and people respond to the film by going, you could tell that he was very, very hungry because of the way that he looked at that bowl of soup. You could tell that that must have been his mother or a relative laying in the coffin because of the way he was looking at her. You could also tell that must have been his daughter or a relative because of the way that he looked at that girl playing with the teddy bear, right? And you can just imagine Lev Kuleshov just giggling because he knows there's none of that at all in there, that this guy's face was flat, that what the audience had done has had made up stuff. They have made up stuff that's not in the shots themselves. That is, point number one up here is that what this experiment shows is that images of all types have meaning in and of themselves, most of which you give, the audience gives to that image, right? If I flash the picture of a cross up here, very big, it means something to you and different to every single person in here. But it has, in that sense, an intrinsic meaning for you. So images have meaning in and of themselves, but point number two is the more important part, is that, but when put in relations, uh, what did I say, uh, or placed next to, yeah, when put in relation with another shot, that shot acquires a new meaning. Guy's flat affect was face cut, woman in a <laughs> coffin, gives rise to he must be sad. Flat face, edited next to little girl playing with a teddy bear means he loves her or something like that. He feels something for her, right? Put in one shot, so now if we just move this idea of this, the dialectic and put one, sh you know, that one shot comes into collision or conflict with some other shot, a new meaning arises because there's no such thing as hunger in a hot bowl of soup and a guy's face. But when put together, meaning the meaning hunger arises out of that, right? So Eisenstein learns very much that what matters about editing is that real time, real space, actual experiential time, tick tock, tick tock, that lived experiential time in film is subordinate to editing. That editing creates time, or indeed, <coughs> editing creates meaning. Right? Because we have shot of guy's face, an edit, shot of the little girl playing with a teddy bear. Uh, so this is an edit, and then another shot, and then you know, on and on. That meaning was starting to arise out of the edit. 
not the content of the shop themselves. Right? So same thing just happened to you in a way when watching South Park. That, that the meaning, the whole, W-H-O-L-D, of his training session comes across to you not because of the individual content of the shot, but because of the ways in which they're edited together. or whatever it says, right? That it's the cinematics, in this case specifically editing, that's creating meaning. This is what Kuleshov's workshop experiment thing shows us, and that Eisenstein is going to push even further to put in terms of story and narrative. That for Eisenstein, if his films were successful, they were successful in getting you to stand up after them, get your pitchfork and your torch and go tear down the man's house. Whoever the man is, whatever systems keeping you down in some sort of way, you would recognize your own subordination in the world and recognize the power that needed to be taken down to keep that thumb off of you in that way. That's his major goal, to remind people of the revolution and to recognize you always have minor revolutions that need to be happening in your life to take the, take the thumb off of you, to get you from uh, being held down in that way. So Eisenstein learns this intimately, and he begins to understand his main claim is going to be that editing, or montage in particular, that dynamic, fast-paced style of editing, is best thought of as collision and conflict of images <laughs> over and over and over, to pierce the mind's eye of the spectator in that way. So the conflict is going to give rise, and now again, working back, backwards, going to give rise to a sense to agitation. Not the agitation that your little brother just won't frickin' leave me alone and he just keeps talking or whatever. Not that sort of agitation, but that you would be uncomfortable in your own situation, in your own life, that you would recognize, I've become complacent in my life. I've accepted all of this power and all of this control over me. I've accepted this way of life, that you would be agitated to action out of that. You would be agitated to get your pitchfork and your torch and or whatever you got and go and tear down the man's house. I mean this figuratively as well as literally in that sense, right? But that's what agitation, that viewing a film, and you're going to feel in just a minute when I show you a whole bunch of this stuff, you're going to feel totally agitated. A, you're going to be agitated in that way like this sucks. But you're also going to feel the effect that would have been sought in 1925 when Battleship Potemkin comes out. Right, so each shot could deliver the stimulus to agitate them, to make them move on, and so make the call to action in some sort of way. And so I'll talk about neutralization as we watch several clips here. Uh, of, I have not watched South Park this year, uh, this season. Is it still good? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should go back and watch it here. Uh, here we go. All right. So battle, uh, and I'm going to show. <coughs> a couple of longer scenes, a couple of short scenes, and then one long scene. So very early in the movie, uh, the battleship is called Potemkin, and they are more just off of the Odessa, the city of Odessa. So you see Odessa up there. They are more just off of that, and the sailors. So there's a big division here, as there would be in the Soviet Union, between the bourgeois and the, everybody else, the proletariat. The bourgeois in this, in this clip, in this film, would be represented by officers on the ship, the guys who are the ruling class on the ship. And the proletariat, everybody else, is going to be what we call the sailors, the non-commissioned guys who have to work on the ship. The officers do not in that way. And there's some serious agitation that's going on amongst the sailors because of the ways in which the man <coughs> has got his thumb down on them. Let's check out. I'm going to mute it after this a little while because you're also going to get tired as can be just <coughs> listening to the music. Because if you ever pay attention to Russian music, it's like, da -da, and it just keeps getting higher and more pitched and fevered, and you can't believe it's going to go any further, and it continues.
He's like, dang, dude, let's go with them, man. <laughs> They're starting to get PO'd. Now they're out on the ship's quarter deck, like the outside top level of the ship, uh, and they're supposed to be eating. Look how long it takes for them to get it. All right, so they're supposed to be eating, and they're like, I don't want to eat that. That's meat. It's hanging outside. It's disgusting. <coughs> I wish my doctor's name was Smirnoff. <laughs> <laughs> Oxtail soup, huh? Oxtail soup. Awesome. I don't eat any meat for 20 years since I ate it. Regardless, awesome. I ate it one time on the beach in, uh, in, uh, in the Ivory Coast. Surfing, well, okay, I wasn't on the beach when I was surfing, but you get the point. Surfing the best waves you've ever seen in your entire life. You could surf a wave on the Ivory Coast for over a minute, one single wave because it comes around the cape in a certain way, and you know, it hits the beach here, but it just keeps going down into a cape, uh, into a, a K. You can surf one wave for uh, over, well over a minute. It was so unbelievable. Decap Farmer's Market, your Decap Farmer's Market, and seeing them whacking the crap out of sides of beef. And they bring out the whole pack of cattle and just sit there and go, Wah. That's one of my favorite favorite place in all of Atlanta, the Decap Farmer's Market. Mmm, maggot soup if you had that. Get it? They're boiling with rage. Oh, see. And for the sailors, nobody's going to eat the meat because you can't have any pudding until you eat your meat. Who knows that? The wall. store and buy like, hey, give me some canned tuna or whatever, I'm not eating, because I refuse to eat the meat. And he's like, you can't even have any pudding. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, so remember this dude on the screen right here, he got smacked on the back a while ago. Now they're in there washing the dishes of the officers who very much enjoyed their delicacy. Yeah, deli Favorite face in all of movie history is about to come up. It's the best face, not my own, but it's the best face ever. My boy who got whacked. Doesn't sound like Peter and the Wolf. Oh, the 
fire in Asia. Here it is. Here it comes. Right here. Watch this. Watch this. I'll back it up. I'll let you see it. Right, let's back that up and watch that again. That's so awesome. <laughs> Not just to see his face, which I still think is just super cool. Let's pause it right on it and have that as a little backdrop. I mean, it communicates absolutely everything, right? Oh, the irony. Anyway, uh, so we're going to take a look at what just at what's going to happen, what you've already seen, and <laughs> smash that plate. Try to count the edits. Now, you, you, you lost it at like eight, right? You got about as far as eight, and that's the best you can do, right? Very quick, fast-paced dynamic, right? So just as I said uh, about I, uh, about the south part of the book, and we're gonna come back. Don't worry, you can see more. Uh, just as just as the south part clip takes a whole bunch of time and condenses it down into just a little bit, Rocky, who knows, indeterminate amount of time, how long Rocky trains, but it makes it look like he just trained for, well, we don't even think about it because it happened in five minutes or however long the sequence might last, but we see the thing as a whole. So editing in this instance, as it always is, is about time in this case. It's also gonna be about space. We'll talk about that with classic Hollywood, but right now it's about time. And for Eisenstein, so South Park is about condensing time taking all of the training and making it into a minute long clip. Eisenstein's <coughs> conception of montage is this notion of conflict and collision, this notion, this understanding of montage is to expand time. Nobody who was frustrated with this plate would go and smash it, but if you, if you watch the clips, that's what he does, right? He goes like that. But what Eisenstein has done is elongated that second or, however, or half a second that it took him to smash that. So he uses this dynamic fast-paced editing to elongate, not condense, but elongate time to watch, uh, to have its force be even greater. So we watch him come down, cut, cut, you, you can't even begin to count how many edits that is. The idea is not that it's sloppy, discontinuous editing. Eisenstein does not think in the ways that Hollywood cinema has begun to think about developing a linear coherence. He's not interested in that at all. He wants you to be aware you're watching a movie so that you're agitated about that. You get up and do something. And so the fluidity that you expect, right, that you go, that was kind of sloppy looking, you might judge in that sense. He doesn't care about it. He's not working for a sense of continuity and flow. He wants you to see it happen. So he expands that time. One of the things you have to do when you get a PhD, countless little hoops and things you gotta do, is after you've written a book, which every PhD has had to do, uh, after I wrote my book, and everyone does, after I wrote my book, you go into what's called the oral defense, uh, and the oral defense is when you're a committee, so you've got like five or six professors who have guided you through the whole process and you know, responded to and helped you rewrite and reevaluate your research and that sort of stuff. And they're also open to the public, so why in the world you'd ever do this? You could go to the English department up here and see if somebody's defending their dissertation through an oral defense, and you could go and watch this horribly abusive thing that happens. You sit in front of these people, and I sat in front of five, uh, four men and a woman with a table about this big for two and a half hours, and they can ask you anything you, they want to ask you, and you've got to be able to respond. There's no re looking anything up, getting back to them. It's like whatever. And I mean, I'm talking two and a half hours, and there are only three things I remember. The first was a sweat stain about this big <laughs> under each armpit because it is so unbelievably nerve-wracking. And uh, I can remember two questions they asked me in two and a half hours. I can remember two. One of them I can quote because, uh, well, there you go. Uh, uh, one of them was this, and this is almost verbatim. You've written about Eisenstein this way. Can you talk about him this way? <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, you know, I mean, there's no, I mean, you could, I could have said, could you rephrase it, but would it have gotten any clearer? There's not a chance you could have gotten any clearer. It's not a clarity 
declared a statement. And so my response was that it was something along this blah, 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 whatever was coming out of my mouth. Something like this, right? That actually then the experiential time, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, sort of time is uninterested, right? Uninteresting for Eisenstein. Back on the notes, real time is subordinate to editing. That what Eisenstein does is take seconds or at real experience time and expand that for force. To expand that time in order to create a more dynamic laser beam or whatever you said to the cerebral cortex of the viewer, right? Um, and so, that, and I'll come back to that, that kind of diagram here in just a moment. The other question I remember was about uh, Ziga Bertov, a uh, Soviet filmmaker of the same time, he's doing a dramatically different thing. One other professor asked, what would a Bert, uh, he did kind of documentary style stuff. He, he said, what would a Bertovian porn film look like? And I, I, I'm like, uh, and he goes, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And we were on to something else. I don't know what it was. That's what you have to do. That's what you got to do. That's one of those many, many hoops that you have to jump through. You also get to take a five-day exam, like every day for eight hours, uh, responding to whatever questions they bring you in a room. Like they can just bring you questions and go, here, write about this. Here, write about this. Holy cow. I'm so glad not to be there anymore. But as soon as that's over, they call you doctor. And you know that whole like run outside and throw your papers in the air. And all that, and that, right to the bar, you know, you're like <laughs> All right, so men uh, the men are all PO'd, uh, the sailors, you, you notice how many more sailors there are than the officers on the ship, so right, the bourgeois, very few, are dominating the workers, the proletariat, the sailors in this instance. So now look time-wise where we are, we're at 15 minutes, so he's called, the admiral has called all of them up to the quarter deck and has said, okay, everyone who wiped their suit, come forward. Okay, so obviously all the officers step forward, like the dude is awesome. Uh, and like one or two cowardly sailors step forward, but a few others end up stepping forward. But where were we at? Like 15 and a half minutes there just a moment ago. Look how long it takes. Oh, well, there we go, a little nice cool dissolve. He goes, if you didn't like it, I'll string you up. And his officer's are like, dude, that'd be cool. I'd watch that. That'd be Because it's going to take so long, I can talk over it. Uh, there's a yesterday in class where I record Star at 2700. A person who had his or her, uh, I, I didn't know because it, he, he or she looked like Kenny, I had, had okay. the hoodie pulled so close, right? And walked up in front of me and said, I, I'm literally about to die. I've got to go. And I said, Oh, good Lord. I mean, I'm like, Are you serious? Like that? And he, she said, uh, No, I, I'm, I'm not really. And I said, Well, oh, God, thank goodness. You said literally. <laughs> Have you ever, you pay attention. 99% of the time, when people use the word literally, they straight up mean figuratively. <laughs> My head literally exploded. It's an impossible statement to say. <laughs> but you'll hear that sort of thing all the time, right? My head literally exploded. <laughs> you don't get a chance to say that. <laughs> all right, so he said, all right, bring out the uh, uh, the firing squad. The admiral said, bring me the firing squad. Look at this, we're three minutes now into it. takes him to come to attention. Four or five shots. Five edits for everybody to come to attention. So he's throwing a bunch of sabers <laughs> under the tarpaulin and he's going to have the firing squad shoot him. Because they didn't like the suit. 
They're insubordinate. Watch this. Here's, here's your bathtub. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, like he often does, Moses shows up. <laughs> Just it's kind of strange, but Moses comes up. <laughs> All right, I know, but he was definitely Richard Gere in the day. Uh, I also, all apologies, I did not know that Moses was Christian either. I, it's a timeline thing. All right, anyway, he comes out and he's like, bring him the rest. We're seven and a half minutes into it. It's been three minutes since he said attention. Time elongating in contrast to in, <laughs> here we go. Wait, we gotta check this out. <laughs> you can see him just making note to himself on his smartphone, like get more mustache gel. <laughs> How long it's taken. Eight minutes now, we're right into it. Kill him already. And they're taking it for the ship. Right, right. We're taking it to, that's a very good comment, right? That idea, that experiential, actual time is not important for Eisenstein. It's edited time. So what he's done here is taken the moments that this has taken, in, in actual time, it's not taken this long for them to get in their guns drawn and aim, guns, they're not guns, and rifles drawn and aimed at these guys, because Eisenstein is continually backed up in time to look at the same amount of, the same part of time from all its different levels, all of the different moments that are happening at the same moment. Remember what the South Park clip said in the, in the song? It said, show a lot of things happening at the same time. That's what Eisenstein has literally done. You've already seen an example of it when I showed you Trip to the Moon. You remember? Projectile shot out of the rocket, and then the next clip you see it go into the eye of the moon, and the eye's going, I can't go so much, so much. And then cut, and you go to the landscape, uh, the uh, uh, surface of the moon, and you see the projectile land again. You don't see it land again. It's the same landing. Right? A projectile doesn't come and land and then take off again and then land again. That didn't happen. Even by choice or by accident, Melies has already done this, just backed up in time. You've seen it thousands of times if you watch Terminator, for example, or anything where things blow up, the Battle of Los Angeles or whatever. You ever notice that when a bus blows up, it blows up like five times? <laughs> I done it about five times. It blows up one time from five different camera angles. They edit around the thing. And it, so it looks like a gigantous, uh, ginormous explosion. But really, it's just been one explosion shown to you five times. That is, they backed up in time just as Eisenstein has done. Now, their intent is not the same in those Hollywood features in which spectacle becomes the main feature of it. They're not interested like Eisenstein is in elongating time to investigate it. They're not in, they're interested in elongating time for spectacle purposes. But you see examples of this all the time. So again, if South Park's example is about time, and it's about the, con the condensation of time, <laughs> Eisenstein's ideas about montage are also very much about time, but about the expansion of time. All right, so these guys start to mutiny. Uh, they do mutiny, and they win, or whatever. They take over the ship. All of Odessa, look how long it's taken. They've already they've taken over. All right. So the, all right, so the town of, we're, we're right by the town of Odessa, and the people at, on the on the land are like, dude, that rocks. Let's go take him some chicken and some goats and real food, man. We support the man. Uh, we support your revolution. We, res we, we respond positively to your mutiny. And then this happens. Now, it's going to happen. Doesn't that sound like Peter and the Wolf? Or Peter and the Wolf? And then the Wolf. Who wrote that music? Well, 
they're still really happy about it. You see how long that's been there happy? No, oh, here's like live chickens. Alright, here we go. She was the Megan Fox Heart's feeling a little tender right now for a place like Syria and other places in the world in which the military are marching around just like this crowd. Right, so the military moved in. Shut that crap down. Don't worry, it's just a movie. Guns at the top of them are going to get even the legless guy down more than 75 seconds. Right? Even that dude who you saw, absolutely hung, is going to make it down that crap in about maximum. I mean, we're being real liberal here and give them 75 seconds, right? But what we end up on, so let's, let me draw out that, let me draw out on that scene. Uh, draw what, what way that scene like, I don't, I don't know if you necessarily want to need to draw this out, but it just helps us to visualize it, right? First thing we've got a whole bunch of military guys who are chasing down the staircase, a whole bunch of uh, people who are running away. We've got a, uh, a, a woman with a very ill son uh, who gets shot and she walks back up to them trying to supplicate. To them. Uh, we've got other people that in film history we just call these people the supplicants. People have said, let's go try to talk them out of it. You see them regularly going, like, you know, hey, don't shoot. Like, what the heck are you doing? And this sort of thing. You got a guy who followed, we see him most significantly as he's following the baby carriage down. He's got little teeny, you know, student glasses. We call it in film history, they call him the student, right? He's watching this whole thing happen. You've got a woman and her baby carriage ends up going down the staircase as well. You've got Cossacks, the guys on the horses who are riding in and cutting off the escape route. That's more or less all the action that's <coughs> happening. If I took a camera, if I decided taking a camera across the street and filmed it from here, you would have watched the entirety of that sequence and it could have really only lasted, let's give it 75 seconds again, being pretty liberal with the thing because it's a big staircase, but they've got guns at the top, so we're going to get to the bottom much more quickly than we normally would. What Eisenstein does is to in order to amplify the force, just as with the plate smashing clip, is he stops time in order to investigate the same moment in time in multiple layers. All of this stuff is happening simultaneously. From the very get-go, if you recall, everyone's sitting there waving and looking really happy and everything, and it says suddenly on top of the, across the screen, and you see a woman's head snap 
back three times, but you actually don't see it recoil, so it's not doing this. It's only going back, and he shows it three times, only snapping back. He edits out it coming forward. That is, it only snaps back one time. You get shot one time, right? Bam! She goes like this. That's the woman with the baby carriage that you see seven and a half minutes later or something. That's when she actually gets shot in actual time in that sense. He has stopped time in order to investigate. So then we cut away more or less the main, we edit around a whole bunch of space. We see that it's a big staircase and individual people, but then we watch the woman with her very young <laughs> child. That's six minutes or so that it comes to when she gets capped at the top here. The supplicants people, the, uh, the woman who gets, uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't show exactly what happens to her. The baby carriage makes it to the end, and then we see some guy in a close-up angrily go across the screen like this, and then we should cut back to that woman and her eyes shot out or something, right? But it's unclear exactly how it happens. We don't see someone click, and then her eye gets shot out. It makes it look as if it's the sword, but regardless, that's happening over here. At the same time, the baby carriage is somewhere down the road. Uh, that one has a staircase. At the same time that the Cossacks came in at the exact same moment that the military started their march, the same time that all, all of these events are happening at the same time. What Eisenstein does in order to see the truth in this, in order to see what it means, Right? In order to know what it means to make knowledge of it, what he does is break down the reality, the real time and experience of this time and space here. He breaks it down, he neutralizes it into individual parts so that he can investigate each of those. So rather than time operating on a continuum like this, he's constantly moving around in time. He's in the same space. Right? He's just editing around that space. But in terms of time, he's constantly jer jerking around. But you're not paying attention to that part. You don't even see that part. You, you get that it's just continually assaulting you. Right? It's continually assaulting you with a I mean, just the music fever pitch keeps going. The editing is operating at that same fever pitch. But you don't pay attention to it in that way where you see what you see is a 12 or 14 minute clip, the whole thing that Eisenstein has actually taken moments of time and showed their multiple layers, therefore to increase the force, that cerebral cortex tapping thing that he's talked about, they talked about in certain places. Now, in, in conclusion, so just hang with me, in conclusion, uh, we would say that a film, that films that depend highly upon, uh, that depend upon editing in order to tell stories are highly directed. When you're watching Battleship Potemkin, which there is not a reason in the world for you to go and watch the entirety of this movie, but if you were to watch it, what you would get from this style of movie is that there's not an alternative way for you to view it. He doesn't give you time. That is, the shots are so short. You don't have time to look and think through and that sort of thing, all of these images, right? You have to keep up with exactly, look at this, look at this, look at this. That sort of thing. You don't have any options on interpreting it at all or looking at it in another way. Think about someone else who relies heavily upon editing in this style of filmmaking. Someone like Steven Spielberg. Very much, when you watch a Steven Spielberg movie, you don't have options on how you relate to those characters. They're not, you can't feel many different ways about Indiana Jones. You can't watch that character move through his stories and react to, I mean, you could be bored and not like it, that's, that's an, always an option. But the way in which the story is constructed and his character is portrayed in that way, not only through acting, I mean through the cinematic aspects of it, you don't have options. You can't respond to him, he's not ambivalent at all. Those types of filmmaking, that type of filmmaking is highly directive in that sense. Look at this, look at this. Now look at it this way. Respond to it in this way. Very much directing your attention in a way that many other films that we're gonna see through the rest of the semester are not. They're gonna get and put the power and the emphasis of meaning generation in the audience. Look around that image. Not one shot that was up here on this, uh, uh, from the uh, Battleship of Duncan, did you ever look around the image? Maybe full shot of them running down the stairs, you just noticed a bunch of people running, but you didn't sit there and ruminate. You didn't sit there and think through that image at all. He directs your attention to it in a certain way, specifically so that he can do his teaching. 
that if you can continually be reminded of the way in which the man, whatever the man is in your life, has got you under his thumb. Bye, Connor.